I'm not David Gusick. I hope you're not disappointed. I'm Pastor Bill Walden. We had a little trouble getting online, and uh, but Lord willing, we're going to be remedying that. So I'm moving things around here. Uh, welcome. Pastor David is uh, taking some time off uh, to be with grandchildren today. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm kind of adjusting things here, so uh, bear with me. I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, I live in Napa, California, and uh, currently pastoring Calvary Chapel of Vallejo, which is uh, just south of Napa. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, I'm pastoring there just for another week or so. We are handing the church off to a young man, a, a missionary from Brazil that's coming to take the church, and so uh, that's what's going on with me. I also am on the staff with Enduring Word. I'm in charge of the Spanish media ministry. I do the daily posting of... Um, questions, uh, or actually, excuse me, daily posting of uh, social media. And um, I also answer questions that come in in Spanish, uh, emails or comments that are made on the different social media platforms. And so that's, uh, that's my job there. And I fill in for David on occasion. I think this is my third time. And I know I have big shoes to fill. I'm going to do my best here. Um, as I said, just if you could just give me a minute, if you do have some questions, please uh, send them in. And uh, we, I'm going to do my best to answer them. And uh, Devin, you can be emailing me questions at my personal email account. And you have that. So that'll be great. Uh, Pastor Bill Walden at gmail.com. So I'm going to start off. Uh, let me start off with a word of prayer. There's um, lots to cover here today. And Devin is saying, be sure to send us your Bible live and, and Christian life questions. So I know we're, we're getting through here. So let me, let me begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for technology that can be used for your glory, Lord. It's an amazing thing. It's a fantastic thing. And we know that it gets used for a lot of bad stuff, but we're grateful uh, for the ability to reach out across the globe and, uh, and communicate with people, Lord, your goodness, your plans, your holiness, your love. Uh, and, and also, as we're going to talk about today, Lord, coming judgment. And so, um, thank you. Pray you'd bless Pastor David, and I'm sure his wife, and Galil is with him. Bless them with family. And we commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, I see a question coming in. Let me, let me get to a question that was uh, posted from last week. And um, a lot of questions that come in. I don't know if I'll be able to get to them all today. And let me say this as well. And this is uh, when I teach on at our at my church, we have a question and answer after every sermon. I, I just uh, I just really don't like the idea of people leaving uh, the church sanctuary with any confusion or or anything like that. And so I'm just very candid and very frank with people that sometimes you know even on Sundays, um, if I don't have an answer, you know I always tease the church. Hey, this is not stump the pastor because that's not hard to do, but. Um, if I don't have an answer, I'll, I'll find it. I'll look for it. I'll find a resource or something. And so today I may not have answers for all of your questions that are, that are going to be coming up. And, uh, but if I don't, hey, I'll look it up and I'll circle back around and I will put some responses on this thread. You can check in a day or two if I, if I don't have an answer or, or at least a good answer. I'm not going to try to bluff my way through anything. Um, also, always want to encourage you to check with Pastor David's commentary, EnduringWord.com. Uh, a little bit of homework, you know, if you do a little bit of the footwork sometimes yourself, it's an amazing thing what you can find. And so his commentary is there for all of us. So this is a question from last week from a, uh, a sister named Layla or Lila, L-E-L-A. Um, it's from June the 23rd. And this is what she wrote. She wrote to Pastor David. She said, in your commentary from Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, you talk about the good and bad angels having a battle in heaven and you said that this happens midpoint of the seven-year period or that, that time period called the Great Tribulation period. Then you referred to Daniel where Michael stands up. And then you referred to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where Michael stands up. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. And the question is this. Uh, Daniel 12, 1 says, at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So her question is, Layla's question is this. My question, is this a mid-tribulation deliverance or mid-tribulation rapture of Christians? And then she says, thank you and thank you for your ministry. So good question. 
So this is how I approach prophecy. And I, and I think it's a fair way to approach prophecy. Um, prophecy to me is kind of like a mosaic that, uh, you know, the, the Bible speaks of prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. There are, there are, okay, we seem to be back. There's a little bit of a problem with the, with the feed. Uh, I was thanking God for technology <laughs> and then it goes and breaks on us. So I was speaking about the idea of prophecy um, being kind of like a mosaic. We, we assemble the pieces of, of prophecy together and we come up uh, with, with an idea or a theology or a, a viewpoint. And so uh, th that's, how I, that's how I see prophecy. I remember when I was a child, I'd go to the dentist's office or to the doctor's office and um, they had those little highlight books to kind of keep us busy. And it was basically, a con you know, connect the dots. And you'd look at something and it didn't, didn't seem like it was anything. And uh, as you connected the dots, things started coming into views, things started coming into shape, and you began to realize, oh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what that was. I thought it was this, but it's actually that. And so forgive me, I'm, I'm making on the fly uh, course corrections here. And so anyway, prophecy is like connecting the dots. And so um, prophecy is not an easy thing to study. And when I teach in Bible colleges, I always tell my students, hey, the, the, ch the challenging thing about prophecy is that it hasn't happened yet. So we study the Bible, like Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved, a workman unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. So prophecy really requires a lot of extra work for us. And then we assemble the pieces and then we put it together and we say, this is what we believe about the future according to the Bible. And it's based on this and this and this. We can't just uh, say we have a, a, an eschatological viewpoint or a prophetic viewpoint based upon emotions or what feels good to us or what seems good to us. Now, let me tell you one short story, just because I want to be honest with you about this. Uh, when I was pastoring, um, been pastoring since 1989, uh, about 10 years ago, I had a little bit of a crisis of of not of faith, but of, of prophetic understanding. Uh, being part of the Calvary Chapel movement, I believe in the rapture of the church, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And yet, um, I was having a little bit of a challenge with that. I told my staff, hey, listen, I'm not sure I believe this anymore. And if and if I don't, in, in just in the integrity of my heart, I may have to step away from the Calvary Chapel movement. And so it what it, what it produced in me was a desire to do a deep dive in, into the, the study of the rapture of the church and, and read broadly all the viewpoints. And so coming out of that, I had a more firm belief in the rapture of the church. And, and so I, I say that to, to say this, it's taken me a while to come to the place where I am now, and I'm still growing, not only as a Christian, but as a pastor as well. And so it's a challenging, it's a challenging study. I don't say that as, as, a, as a, a way of excusing myself or excusing any one of us. It's just a challenging study. So there's no point, uh, there's no reason for disagreeing uh, that leads to kind of contention or anger or name calling. Um, some, you know, some people have accused me of, of offering escapism and not preparing Christians to go through the great tribulation period and they assign kind of, you know, negative um, intention on my part and that kind of thing. I'm not saying that for the purposes of saying poor me. I'm just saying that sometimes we get contentious with one another as believers over prophecy when we keep in mind that it's a difficult thing to assemble and it hasn't happened yet. And so if we can agree to disagree agreeably, give, give one another grace, but also not be lazy in our attitudes about prophecy, uh, that we need to really study and show ourselves approved. And if you have a viewpoint, uh, you need to be able to defend it. All the while accepting the fact that there are some good other people out there, other good Christians out there that have a different viewpoint. So that's a little bit of a disclaimer. I uh, hope it's not, sounds like an excuse at all. So Layla was asking this, and we're going to look first in Revelation chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 12. She said first this, uh, re regarding Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, uh, you talked about the good and bad angels having a battle in heaven. You said that this happens midpoint of the seven-year period. So we want to take a look at what she's talking about. And uh, so we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, I'm uh, just going to give a quick overview on this because to do a deep dive, we just don't have the time for it. We have other questions to consider. So Revelation chapter 12, my take on it is this, that, that we are at the midpoint of, of, the, of the great tribulation period. 
It says this, and I'll read it and just make some very brief comments. Just try to frame it and try to give us a little bit of a, of a perspective. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, we remember that the, uh, the Apostle John is on the island of Patmos. He's receiving visions. So these things are illustrations. These things are um, visions that he's having that are pointing him towards something. They're not the actual thing. They are suggesting something. So we have to connect the dots once again. And in prophecy, we need to connect the dots. Is there anywhere else in the Bible that we see anything about a woman clothed with the sun? And in the book of Genesis, we read about Joseph having a similar version, not an exact version, but that uh, he was surrounded by his family, by his brothers and by his parents, and they were bowing down to him. And then uh, he actually had two versions of that. And so we believe, that's a very brief answer. Forgive me for not going deeper with it. We believe that this woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. It says then in verse 2, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So we believe that this isn't uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, that this is a, a description of the nation of Israel giving birth to her Messiah. I'm going to build the case. Let me go on. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. On his heads. So we believe that this is Antichrist. Once again, a lot of dots to connect. We're not going to be able to do that now. One thing that I do want to point out, fiery red dragon, we read in other places in, 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 uh, in the book of the Revelation that this is pointing to Satan and to Satan's man. Seven heads, ten horns. Heads are heads of government. Horns represent power. So we believe that there will be a confederation of nations or, or something like that, 10 nations, Antichrist will come onto the scene, dethrone three of them, but he'll have the power of those three. So there will only be seven nations or seven entities, if you will, but with all of that power, great fiery red dragon having seven heads, 10 horns, seven diadems on his head. We believe that this is an image or an illustration of the Antichrist midway through the Great Tribulation period. I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. Let's connect the dots. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them back to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, one of the things, and once again, if we had the time, and we just don't, but uh, I would refer you to, to Luke chapter 4 and Pastor David's commentary on Luke chapter 4, where we see Jesus going into a synagogue in Capernaum and, and reading the scroll, out of, uh, reading out of Isaiah from a scroll and saying, today this has been fulfilled in your midst. If you read the, the passage in Isaiah, you would see that Jesus left off one portion of a verse so what Jesus is saying there at the synagogue in Capernaum is that prophecy has been fulfilled in your midst, but I'm not going to read all of it because there's still part of what Isaiah is saying that hasn't happened yet. I say that to say this. In prophecy, there is oftentimes a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. And they can be divided, you know, in English in the English language just simply by a comma or a period at the end of a sentence. And so this seems to be that. Verse 4 seems to be saying, at some point in the distant past, Satan, the, the red dragon, the fiery dragon, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The word stars is often translated as messengers. We believe this speaks of the fallen angels. Satan is a created being. He's a created angel. Demons are created angels, and they had it in their hearts to rebel against God. We see this in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness uh, when Satan tried to get Jesus to worship him. Satan always desires to take the place of God. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and to devour her child as soon as, as it was born. This, we believe, speaks of the time of Jesus' physical birth, when Herod received news from the wise men that the king was born, he said, go find this king that I may go to worship him. Actually, Herod feared another king. And we know that eventually he sent out and had all baby boys under two years old massacred. 
Satan has always had uh, a heart against the Jewish people. And so we see that happening here. And this seems to be talking about that. And this is all in the past. This part of John's vision speaks of what had happened previously. Now, it's very interesting, uh, but this is what I believe, okay? That that was the past fulfillment. And then between verses 5 and 6 is the future fulfillment. That that same spirit of persecution that Satan had at the birth of Jesus is now manifested in the person of the Antichrist when he marches into the temple of God and demands to be worshipped as God. That same persecution of the Jewish people now takes place in the far future, midway through the tribulation period. For we read in verse 6, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, the woman being Israel. So there's a time in the future when Israel will flee into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days or three and a half years. And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So, verse 7 speaks of a spiritual battle in heaven. And now that this is an amazing thing to think about. You know, uh, we often as Christians say, you know, our, our, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and so on. We battle in prayer. We battle for truth. Those kinds of things are all true. But it seems that there's going to be an actual physical battle between Satan and his fallen angels and Michael and the angels of God. And Michael and the angels of God will prevail. And this will be the final expulsion of Satan to the earth. He'll no longer have access to the throne of God. We see Satan having access to the throne of God in the book of Job. He still has access to the throne of God, even in these days in which we live. Uh, he is called the accuser of the brethren, and he accuses us before the throne of God. In the future, when this happens, when finally Satan is no longer allowed to have access to the throne of God in heaven, it seems that he intensifies his efforts against the people of God, the, the nation of Israel. Now, this isn't the church. We believe that the church is gone. I'll speak about that in a moment. But these are the, the, the nationalistic Jews, and I think in particular the Jews who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Remember in, in, in the Olivet Discourse, when, when Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, pray that it doesn't happen in winter and pray that it doesn't happen on a Sabbath and how difficult it will be for nursing mothers. When you see the abomination of desolation, flee into the wilderness. Now, I've been to Israel just only two times, but I, interestingly enough, my wife and I were there one time when it snowed in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not built for snowy conditions. There were traffic jams everywhere. It's interesting that Jesus would say, pray that it's not a Sabbath. Why? In my opinion, because some of those Jews who are alive when Antichrist reveals himself and declares to be worshipped as God, Jesus is saying, listen, you need to get out of town. You need to flee. But there's going to be a hesitation on their part if it's on the Sabbath day because they don't want to travel on the Sabbath day. These are some of the reasons I believe that this is midway through the Great Tribulation period and that Jesus is specifically speaking, and now John is specifically being taught that this is an, an event that's going to happen with the Jewish people. So, the angels of, of God and Michael fight against Satan and his fallen angels. They lose. Satan is in, uh, incensed about it. Verse 9, we are in Revelation 12, verse 9. So the, great, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so that's the background. That's a long, kind of a long answer here. I'm going to watch my time. That's kind of a long answer here to what Layla had written. She asked Pastor David, you talk about the good and bad angels having a battle in heaven. You said that this happens midpoint of the seven-year period. Now, it, it seems that Layla had a little bit more knowledge of this, but, but I need to cover these things for those who might, this might be, you might be new to the conversation or new to the study. Then she said, Pastor David, you referred then to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And I think this is a, uh, a connected passage. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And it says this, At that time, Michael shall stand up. Now, what did we just see in the book of Revelation? Michael's standing up, if you will, against Satan and his angels. And the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So Michael has been given the unique 
uh, responsibility, if you will, of being the guardian of the nation of Israel. Daniel goes on to say this, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and that time your people shall be delivered. That's what we saw in the book of Revelation chapter 12, that the, the, the faithful Jewish people who flee Jerusalem into the wilderness to a place prepared for them will be taken care of. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting to some to shame and everlasting contempt. I believe that's later on at the great white throne judgment. So, Layla's final uh, answer, or excuse me, question on this was this. Daniel 12, 1 says, at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. I believe that, that here Daniel and what John was seeing were speaking specifically to the, to the faithful Jews who believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that faithful remnant who will be saved. I believe that the rapture of the church happens back in Revelation chapter 4. I would refer you to Pastor David's commentary on that. Um, he does a fantastic job. Once again, it's a deep subject. We want to get to some of these questions here. I see some questions coming up from, from Devin. Um, I will say this, though, and it's kind of interesting. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, once again, I refer you to Pastor David's commentary, but the Apostle Paul is talking to, to some of the Corinthians who, who aren't sure about the resurrection of the dead. They want to know how is it going to happen? What's it going to look like? When is it going to happen? One of the things that, that Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, don't you know that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? That in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we shall be changed. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain uh, shall be changed and, and taken to heaven with them. I liken it, and, and when I explain it kind of humorously, I liken it this way. If I wanted to step outside the space capsule, I couldn't do it with my my Vans tennis shoes, a t-shirt, and a pair of 501 Levi's. I need to be retrofitted for heaven. And so the glorified body of the resurrected or and or raptured believer is that retrofitting. It's that resuiting of us to be able to exist in the presence of, of a most holy God. So there will be a rapture. The question is when <laughs> and who. And that's really, so I just want to encourage all the readers, out, all the listeners out there, excuse me. There will be one generation that doesn't die, but will be changed. Now, the big kind of argument or debate is that happen before the Great Tribulation? Does it happen in the middle? Does it happen at the end? Uh, another story. So long answer. <laughs> Uh, it's a question from Layla. It's a good question. Appreciate it. I hope I gave a little bit of insight to it. Let me get to some of these uh, questions here that Devin is sending in to me. Okay, here we go. Um, question is this. What This is from Lupe. What kind of evil does God create? Isaiah 45 verse 7 says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Wow, I have no idea. Lupi, I'm just going to be honest with you for the sake of not trying to bluff you. I, I, Number one, I would encourage you to check Pastor David's commentary. Number two, I will check it, and I will check some other sources, and I will give you an answer on that in this thread uh, attached to this YouTube broadcast uh, as soon as I can. So... Another question, the God of silence on the above note, Proverbs 6.16, I think has a list of things that God hates. Many people think God doesn't hate, but I believe that hate is part of love. Your thoughts. God is infinitely more holy than we are. We, we understand this verse, and it's a parallel verse, perhaps. It, it, show, it gives us an illustration or, or, or a, a comparison, if you will. As the heavens are higher above as the heavens are high above the earth, so God's thoughts are above ours. There's no end 
to the omniscience or the wisdom or the knowledge of God. There's nothing that God doesn't know or hasn't ever known. There's, there's no hint of unholiness in God. He's not just a lot better than the best of us. James tells us that in God there is no shadow of turning. There's no darkness. There's no shadow of turning. There's no like dark corner. If you had a, if you had a, a football stadium uh, full of light and you searched for one dark corner and found a dark corner, you'd say, well, it's not totally light. In God, there's no dark corners. There's no darkness at all. God's view of sin is infinitely greater and deeper than ours. And I would say that his, he is extremely offended at any kind of sin or wickedness or evil. The Bible does use the word hate. The Bible tells us as Christians, be angry, but don't sin. So many times when we think of the word hate, it can, it can have petty uh, connotations or uh, I'm, I'm tired of you or I'm impatient with you or I don't like you or something like that. I think it's Martin Lloyd-Jones that said, as Christians, we ought to be angry at things. We ought to be angry at wickedness and at evil. God is very angry at wickedness and at evil. And yet, what delays his judgment is that his desire is that none should perish and that all should be saved. And so, uh, Proverbs 6.16 has a list of things that God hates. Many people think God doesn't hate, but I believe hate is part of love. I think, I think God loves us so much that he hates when we do destructive things against ourselves, when we sin against one another. If we use it in that context, I would be uh, very comfortable with it. But once again, if we are comfortable using the hate, the word hate, it has to be used in its highest form, in its most holy form. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. So let me, oh, I, I just lost a question. Oh boy, too quick on the draw. One more question here. Bob, Bob said this, how can someone break the bad habit of spending too much time on social media? <laughs> Well, if, if, if God is uh, convincing you and or convincing slash convicting you, Bob, that you're on social media too much, then you need to obey him. Um, social media can be a blessing. I, I've watched some really il uh, illuminating videos lately about uh, church business and some other things. Been listening to some good podcasts. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of junk out there too. So I think God gives us the responsibility within ourselves uh, to, to take care of these things. If he's convincing you or convicting you that you should um, get off of social media, you know, I, I could say this sarcastically a little bit, then just get off social media. Um, I remember being in high school, I asked the wrestling coach, hey, what's a good way to lose weight? And he just said, quit eating. <laughs> and it was, it kind of struck me as almost being sarcastic and kind of blunt, but that's, that's the truth of it. Um, if you want to get off social media, get off social media. Pray about it and, and maybe, you know, uh, maybe hand over all your devices to somebody for a month and just say, hey, don't let me have it. Maybe, you know, buy a cheap uh, flip phone for a while that has no internet access and, uh, and, and give your smartphone to somebody and just say, hey, you know, I'm just taking a month off. I just want to see what God wants to do in my life. So, of course, we want to be reachable. You know, we want people to be able to get a hold of us, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, just take the steps to do it. Uh, separate yourself from the devices. If that's a desire, fantastic. If that's what God's doing in your life, that's fantastic. I would say also, don't just get off social media, but get more into God's word and uh, and read it and and get some good Christian books and, and immerse yourself in them. If that's what God's doing in your life, that's fantastic. Uh, but to break the habit, you just have to you know, you have to take the steps. Um, Jesus uh, taught us, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Obviously, he's not saying actually do that, but it means separate yourself from that thing uh, that is causing you a problem. So I would just, I would take those steps, I think, Bob. So uh, may the Lord bless you in that as you pursue that. Question from Everett. Hi, everyone. I was wondering if you could explain what is meant by the word of God in John chapter 1. 
Some people are referring to it in a literal sense as the Bible, but others, such as myself, believe it's a poem referring to Jesus uh, as the Son of God. How can I go about explaining this? Well, let me turn there and um, let's just read uh, what what John writes to us. Uh, if, yeah, let's just read it. And see, let's just read it and see what we get for at face value. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, so there's something called the Word, and the Word was with God. So in the beginning, when time started, I like to say when the clock started ticking, whatever the Word was pre-existed time. So that means the Word is eternal, and the Word was God. And so we are told right away when the when the clock started ticking, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, so the word is a him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So the word is a him, and the word has all power. In him was life, and the life was men. Uh, the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or overpower it. And then down in verse 14, and the word became flesh. So the Word put on flesh. So the Word existed at one time without flesh, but the Word put on flesh and, and came in human form. And John says, dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word, we believe, in John chapter 1 is Jesus Christ. Pre-existed before the clock started ticking, second person of the triune Godhead, didn't have flesh, put on flesh, dwelt among us, pitched his tent, tabernacled among us. And John says, we saw him and we saw the grace and the truth of his life. And that's grace and truth that could only come from the Father. And so the question, once again, I was wondering if you could explain what is meant by the word of God in John chapter one. I think, I th hopefully I did. Hopefully I just did. Some people are referring it to the literal, to it in the literal sense as the Bible, but others such as myself, so I don't think I don't think John there is talking about the Bible, though though obviously the Bible is the Word of God, but here we see the Jesus being called the Word. Um, but but Everett is suggesting it's a poem referring to Jesus as the Son of God. How can I go about explaining this? Well, I don't I don't think it's a poem. I think it's a description, and that might be a better way. It doesn't seem to have a poetic nature to it. And I understand that it was written in Greek. Maybe the Greek has more rhythm and rhyme to it. Um, and, and and that might be the case. I don't I don't know Greek. I've never studied Greek. Only a few words here and there. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be a poem. So that's my best take on that. Michael says this, how do we reconcile the concept that all of the church fathers teach that baptism plays a part in salvation? Well, I haven't read all the church fathers, and um, and so I can't comment on what they say. Um, I think salvation, excuse me, baptism is obviously very important. My understanding of baptism is that it's an outward sign. It's a declaration of an inward work. Uh, we know uh, that you know, that the thief on the cross uh, told Jesus, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And obviously there was no time for that thief to be baptized. And so, uh, you know, a deathbed confession, uh, confession of faith in a hospital, I don't think God would exclude somebody from heaven because uh, on their last breath, they didn't have enough strength to, to you know, get baptized. And so... Um, I don't know what all the church fathers teach, um, and it's a, little, it's a little bit of a packed question, if I could say, Michael, and I'm not, I'm not judging your intentions at all. How do we reconcile the concept that all of the church fathers, I would say, who's all, you know, and whoever is saying all of the church fathers, how many of the church fathers did they actually read? I mean, you know, if they could cite, you know, I've read 50 of the church fathers and and 48 of them say this, then that's a little, that's a little something that we can get our hands onto and, and deal with a little more directly. But um, I think baptism is incredibly important. And I think if a Christian is able to get baptized, that they should. And Jesus says that we should. But we are not saved through baptism. We're saved through Jesus Christ and faith in, in what he did for us. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, Mikey says this, what are your thoughts about when Damascus gets destroyed before or after the rapture? I believe, I don't know. I was going to jump the gun. I was thinking Babylon. 
which is after the rapture. Damascus, I'll have to look that one up, Mikey. I'm, I'm, I'm saving all these questions and I will respond. So uh, I'm, once again, I'm not going to try to bluff. Okay. Uh, Shar says this, and you can send me more questions, uh, Devin, if, if there are any. Since you are bilingual, you're probably familiar with the story legend of the Virgin of Guadalupe. What is your take on that? Well, I am fairly bilingual. Uh, no, no puedo enseñar la Biblia en español, pero, pero yo puedo ordenar tacos. <laughs> I can't teach the Bible in Spanish, but I can order tacos. Um, and I don't know about the Virgin of Guadalupe. You know, it's interesting. My, my mother's side uh, of the family uh, is from Mexico, from actually from Chihuahua. And I, and I did grow up as a Catholic, but I grew up as an American Catholic, really not as a Mexican Catholic. So I'm not that familiar with the Virgin of Guadalupe. You know, whenever, whenever somebody has a vision of something, and I'm presuming that this is a vision uh, of, you know, the Virgin Mary, as, as she would be called, you always have to say, okay, somebody saw something. Okay, somebody saw something. You can't dispute that somebody saw something. But what is the message? What is the message that is being communicated? We cannot discern truth simply by uh, an, an experience. I mean, the Bible, the Word of God, is our ultimate authority, and it's, our, it's the final say of our lives. Um, we know in the last days that, that Antichrist is going, to be coming, is going to come and do false signs and wonders. He's going to have some limited miraculous power. We remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Moses said, who, you know, who is your God? And Moses threw down his staff. It became a serpent. And the magicians of the Egyptian court threw down their staffs and they became serpents as well. And Moses, a, a serpent, devoured the, uh, Pharaoh's serpents, if you will. But my point is this, that, that, that Satan has some power to alter nature. It, it appears very clearly uh, when when Satan when jo when Satan excuse me went before the Lord and and is asking God about Job and said you know let me get to him and and he'll curse you and um, God says you know you can't touch him but everything that he has you can you can get to um, Satan went out and had Job's children killed how with a storm it's very interesting Satan was able to somehow manage the weather to evil ends. And so, Virgin of Guadalupe was your question. When we see something or experience something that, that is obviously not of this world, okay, how do we know where it's from by the message that it brings? Um, and so, I wouldn't trust uh, a vision or an appearance or anything like that, just because I have a sensation, I have an experience, I always have to say, what is the message uh, that that experience is bringing? And that's how I will judge it. So hope that helps. Salvation Zone says this, if we're forever going to be with Jesus and if he's everywhere at once, omnipresent, does that mean we'll be everywhere at once with him as well? What will we be like? Uh, no, he's, om he's omnipresent, but we're not. And, uh, and a, a, an argument might even be made that after his incarnation, you know, when John goes to sees, sees Jesus as the lamb that has been slain uh, in the throne of God, it's in Revelation chapter 4 or chapter 5, he sees Jesus with the, apparently with the marks of crucifixion and, and, and the, the scourging upon his body. Just because we're going to be with Jesus in glory doesn't mean that we will be omnipresent. And I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here a little bit. And pastors would say I'm shooting from the lip a little bit, you know, not, not with a careful aim. But I, I'm wondering, and I'll have to look this up, and I may have to, to walk this back a little bit, but I'm wondering about the omnipresence of Jesus after his death and resurrection. And so I'll have to research that a little bit. But I can say with confidence, um, if he's everywhere at once, does that mean we'll be everywhere at once? No, no, because we are not divine. We, we are or never could be omnipresent. Uh, it teaches in the, in the millennial kingdom that we'll serve uh, as, as kings and priests with Jesus and, and we'll be with him in the new Jerusalem, but we won't be omnipresent. So I hope that's helpful. Jennifer says this, does Satan want to replace God or work as his equal? Absolutely. Um, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel 28, 
Jesus in the wilderness. I mean, Satan is always saying, I will exalt myself above the Most High. I will, you know, I will be like God. Um, the thing that, that Satan will do through Antichrist, when, when Antichrist steps into the temple and demands himself to be worshipped as God, that's, that's the very heart of Satan. Uh, remember what Satan said to Jesus in the wilderness temptation in the, in, in, when Jesus was fasting. If you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the, of the world. And so Satan is always desiring to be seen as God. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, Satan uh, is an imposter and his, his ministers come as angels of light. So they're deceivers and they are imposters. And one of the names of Satan is deceiver. And so he pretends to be something that he's not. So yes, absolutely, Jennifer, Satan does want to replace God. Uh, and, and he doesn't want to work as his equal. He wants God to be gone. And that's, that's made manifestly clear uh, through the statements of Antichrist. When Antichrist demands to be worshipped as God, he, he's not going to just be against Christian. He's going to be against Jews. He's going to be against Mormons. He's going to be against Hindus, Buddhists, Baha'i faith everybody, there's going to be, in his mind, only Antichrist worship. And so that's always been uh, Satan's uh, desire. So Andrea says this, a friend asked me if we as believers have to support Israel on a political level or if a spiritual support is enough, can I separate the two approaches? Great question. I say absolutely support Israel on a spiritual level. I don't think we are called to support them on a political level. That, that's just my opinion. I don't, I don't know of any way that I could back that up. Um, the Bible does say regarding Jerusalem I, Jerusalem, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so I certainly want to stand spiritually with the nation of Israel. I don't feel compelled to support every political move that they make. So I don't think that's a requirement for, for Christians in 2022. There probably are some church movements that will say that you should. Uh, I, I wouldn't be in, in that camp. Uh, good, very, very good question. Okay, let me move on here to some other uh, questions. Okay. Leroy Moore Jr. Where in the Holy Scriptures does it say that Jesus is the second being of the triune God. It says it in a lot of places, and I'm trying to figure out a way to present it. There are many scriptures, and I can't think of anything right now, and and I and, and that might be a shame on me as a pastor. There are there are many passages. Well, Jesus is called the Son of God. Okay, it's coming to me a little bit now. Um, at his baptism with, with uh, John the Baptist in the Jordan River, there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so that's linking the son to the father. And then we see the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove. So we see the, there the appearance uh, of the triune Godhead. There are many passages, and I'd have to do a little bit of homework. You know what? Let me get back to you on this one, Leroy. And it's a fair question. Um, Jesus is the second being of the triune Godhead. That's, that's the only one that comes to mind right now. Some of you might be raising your hand and saying, I know, I know something, and, and uh, I wish you could chime in, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I mean, you, you could write in if you want to share with Leroy your thoughts on that. Anahu, Anahui, excuse me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. When Jesus returns, will he be like his first coming in the flesh? Uh, no, because when he was raised from the tomb, uh, he was raised with a glorified body. So he went in the tomb one way and came out of the tomb another way. And so uh, will he be fully God and fully man? Yes, he will be fully God and fully man. Um, forever a man, um, as I understand it, um, which was something brand new uh, in his incarnation. Uh, earlier, somebody was asking about you know the, the word in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And so when time started, uh, Jesus, God the Son, was with God the Father, but not in flesh. And then the time finally came uh, in, in God's providential plan for salvation and the rescue of humanity and the rescue of all things uh, for, for Jesus to put on flesh. 
and then he went into the tomb uh, with that beaten flesh and came out of the tomb uh, with glorified flesh. And so uh, my understanding ought always to remain uh, that way. Uh, as, as, we, as I mentioned earlier in Revelation chapter 4, um, at 4 and 5, uh, John's first view of heaven is to see Jesus, chapter 5, uh, Revelation, to see Jesus as a lamb that had been slain. Um, he saw the lion of the tribe of Judah and who appeared as a lamb that had been slain. So this, that speaks of the physicality uh, of the risen Lord. So hope that's, hope that's uh, helpful. Well, uh, I'm getting a message here from Devin that that was the last question. So, um, I'll wait for another cue from Devin about how to handle this in signing off. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Oh, and yes, did I did fine with your name? Great. And I know I can't say it. I don't remember what I said. Uh, let me kind of scroll back through this, if I may. Uh, we started just a touch late. Thanks, you guys, for being patient. And, you know, I thought I had it all set up and was praising God for technology. And then, uh, oh, there's one more here. Chaz says this, Luke 21, 27. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. Yes, amen. You know, the opening question wasn't just about the rapture. It was about Revelation chapter 12 and Daniel chapter 12. Anna Hui. Okay, great, Anna. But it included, the, the idea included the rapture uh, of the church. And Paul describes that as the blessed hope. He tells us that we are not appointed unto wrath. And so I believe very much in the rapture of the church. And I believe there's nothing that's hindering it from happening right now. Okay. Oops. Donna says this. I hope you don't mind, Devin. I'm just going to take a couple more here. Who will we rule and reign during the millennial reign? During, during the great tribulation period, um, many people will come to Jesus Christ and be saved. Many of them will lose their lives. But at the end of the great tribulation period, there will be just plain old humans that survive those seven years. And those plain old humans will enter in uh, to the millennial reign of Christ. And they will get married and they will have babies. And uh, so my understanding is that there will be kind of two classes of people there ruling in the millennial reign. There will be those, there will be the church and, and the saved of God. Uh, we will be in our glorified bodies having been changed. And then there will be just kind of normal humans who will, as I said, get married, uh, have children, work their jobs, populate the earth. And so Jesus will be um, ruling from Jerusalem and we will be assigned. We will be assigned areas, just like there's a, you know, a national government. We have Washington, D.C., then there's governors in the state. Um, and there are, you know, mayors and councilmen and assemblymen. And all. just think about how politics is arranged and the levels of politics and people have their different uh, responsibilities. Um, that's going to be us in the millennial reign. And we will be ruling over, over an earth that is getting repopulated uh, by, the, by the people that survived uh, the Great Tribulation period. So, um, and the world will get to see what it's like um, to have Jesus as king. <laughs> no, no, uh, no corrupt leadership. Won't that be great? Well, we're going to wrap it up. So I really appreciate, once again, the uh, 
the patience. Uh, I had, had a little bit of a technical juggling act to do there when we got started. Appreciate the questions. I'm going to go back through them again and, and try to fine tune some of them. And, uh, and I will report my findings, report my answers. If I can enhance my answers a little bit, I'll put it on this thread. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that'll be good. So, okay, people are saying thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. Let me end with a word of prayer. God bless you guys. Father, thank you, Lord, that we were able to finish this up. Thank you. Uh, once again, pray for Pastor David and his wife, Inga Lil. We pray for Enduring Word. Thank you for the work that you're doing, all the translations, all the places that the Word of God is going out to, and the commentary that you've given Pastor David, and all the workers that are helping with that all. We, we, we rejoice in this work, Lord. And uh, but Lord, you, God, you, Jesus, are our greatest, truly, Lord, our greatest source of joy. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you did put on flesh and you did manifest the Father to us and you did give your life for our sins and that you do forgive those who come to you. So thank you. Pray you'd bless each one watching today and help us to follow you, God, for our blessing and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, God bless you. I'm going to sign off. Bye-bye.